We'd like to welcome you back to another episode of the Outside 50 Podcast presented by usfootynews.com. I'm your host, Rick Shabani, and alongside me, as usual, Ben Martinez and Tara Silky. G'day, Rick. How are you? Doing well. How's it going? Glad to be here. Yeah, as always, on the line today, we've got Bob DeGemis from Detroit, Michigan. Hi, guys. Now... Some of the USAFL people out there might not know, but Detroit has been trying with varying degrees of success to start up a footy club from scratch. And uh, as we'll learn in a little bit, um, there's a little bit of competition for the real estate up there as far as footy goes. But yeah, Bob, tell us a little bit about uh, what your background is and how it's been going in terms of churning up interest for a Detroit footy club. Yeah, um, like I was telling earlier, uh, Tara a little earlier, um, I'm, I'm an import. Um, you know, everyone hears the bad news about Detroit, about everything leaving, but it's an all true. And uh, I came here from uh, D.C. in the summer of 2016. And um, my footy background, um, prior to playing uh, as a kid, I grew up in Connecticut, um, and which is, of course, the home of ESPN. And uh, as a kid, I'm 43 now, I'll date myself, I'm not ashamed. Um, <laughs> they, at that time, they were airing um, footy AFL, uh, you know, on to kill the dead air, which is great. And as kids, we like caught on to it. Um, and then after college, uh, 99, um, I ended up moving to DC from Philadelphia. And um, I ended up linking up with the then BW Eagles now just Washington. They split themselves off uh, into two. They've got the numbers now. Um, but I played there in my younger days, 2002. Um, and at that group was, uh, you know, that they have a great thing going on there because it's kind of a natural uh, landing pad and sort of a pool of players to pull from. I mean, they got the embassy in DC, so it's a, it's a, it's a no brainer. Um, in 2016, when I moved here, you know, I, I didn't know anybody. Um, I, 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 we sort of followed my wife's job, and she's from here. But just socially, you know, I didn't know anybody. And, and I had done some research uh, about what was here for footy. And, you know, as you all know, the people that play footy are a pretty outgrowing bunch. So if I could find the people that would be interested in footy, uh, I think my life would be uh, very good. Uh, uh, so at any rate. Um, did some research. Footy wasn't here. It was, you know, from what I could see, they had a club going for six, seven, eight years um, prior to, you know, the 2008 recession. Um, and, and it looked like they probably had a committed group. And then, you know, who knows, just, I mean, you guys know how it is, people age. And if there isn't sort of a young crop to sort of follow through uh, behind the, the old guys, um, you know, it, it sort of gets dropped um so i started this facebook page just because it's such a using social media is such a low low cost easy reach way to find like-minded people and um started that page in 2017 so it was a year after i'd been here and it started getting picked up piece by piece and and people started jumping on i think there's 150 people or something like that and um some there's some Aussies on there, um, not uh, as many as you would find elsewhere. I think if you're in California or New York or DC, um, you'd certainly find more. But they are there, and we've actually become pretty close with um, some folks. Uh, there's a couple that we kind of hang out with that come out and kick around with us, um, who are, are a little bit older, like ourselves, who have kids. Uh, but it, it's been challenging because, again, like I was telling Tara. Um, Southeast Michigan, if you've ever been here, it's it's just a different uh, in economy. It's a different ecosystem than, again, the East Coast, where you've got city after city after city, and it's a natural landing spot for Australians because, you know, you've got international cities like New York or D.C., and they're also natural landing spots for young 20-somethings, 30-somethings, because there's so many colleges, right, um, versus Detroit, 
I mean, again, besides myself, there aren't a lot of people flowing into Detroit. And then second, um, Detroit City itself, I mean, because it's got this industrial history, I mean, there's only, as far as I can count on the top of my head, there's only two colleges, universities in the actual city of Detroit proper. I mean, you got Wayne State, which is kind of a regional um, uh, commuter school, and then there's uh, Detroit Mercy. And then, you know, the, the colleges everybody knows about, and I think are where I start need to start making friends is over an hour to the west in, in Ann Arbor, uh, right. University of Michigan, is where, you know, the greener pastures are probably are. Um, so. Oh, yeah, and I was about to say, you know, the, the state of Michigan has no great sporting history. You know, there's, <laughs> yeah. definitely, there's definitely interest. And you touched on a lot of great points, Bob, I reckon. You know, obviously, Detroit's in a tough spot right now. That's well documented. And, um, again, not a huge Aussie community and definitely a different animal uh, compared to the people we've talked to recently from, like, uh, Wisconsin or you know, Chicago Swans, teams like that sure. that – you know, they're in kind of a spread out part of the country, too, in the Midwest. But, you know, at the very least, they have bigger population bases. And they're also just there's a bigger Aussie community there as well. Absolutely. So you, de- you guys definitely have your challenges, but it's, it's good to see that you guys have like uh, a strategy, uh, things that you're trying to do to bolster interest and bolster recruitment. Where did you originally start in terms of, you know, you're settled in Detroit, um, your family's moved here with you. And you want to start a footy club? Um, who did you turn to first, and how were you able to reach out to them? So, like I said, like social media was the first and more or less our sole uh, uh, way to start hitting people. I mean, that the name that I have on there kind of hits the key notes. I mean, without even having uh, a, a nickname, um, you know, just Detroit and footy in it, and you know, anyone who's going to be interested in, in AFL football will be able to find it and it's and it's held true but um you know again like i was saying like the 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 geography of southeast michigan's funky because the city of detroit the population in the city of detroit is as low as it's been since the civil war it's something like uh, it's like a couple hundred thousand but meanwhile the footprint of detroit proper is is massive you could put like four major cities if you and drop it in if you could that's how much so like the pbs specials you see of like blight and stuff that's that's what it is but the the sprawl spreads out you know an hour in every direction so that's you know again that's our challenge like because there's folks that consider themselves quote unquote metro detroit that i mean even you know professional sports uh the pistons and the um Lions, who who are Detroit teams, used to play close to an hour away. Um, so that's us. Like we've got guys that are that want to play and they're pretty interested. But you know, putting together a training is a rather interesting exercise um, because everybody's all over the place. Yeah, definitely. And um, obviously, Michigan is a bit of a compact state in terms of other major cities being relatively close by, like Lansing or Grand Rapids. Um, and for our Aussie listeners out there, you know, uh, Detroit is kind of, again, in a very interesting geographic position because, you know, southeast part of the state, uh, the, the downtown or the CBD area is like on the border with Canada to the southeast. And then all the other suburbs sprawl out to the north and the west kind of. So that's right. Yeah, exactly. But that's kind of going into my next point. Um, there are quite a few Canadian clubs on the other side of the lake and um yeah afl ontario does a really good job um i actually have a teammate here in la who lived up in toronto for a decade and played in the competition up there have you been able to reach out to them at all in terms of kind of kind of doing what um they do in the pacific northwest with the vancouver teams they've sort of found us um (laughs) and there's a there's one or two guys that have come across the bridge um, yeah, you, know, you got to pay your ten dollar toll or whatever, and it's kind of a pain in the neck. So I mean, they're not going to be regulars because it's just it's just a wicked pain in the neck because you got to get. Th- well, right now you can't cross um, because of what's going on. And obviously, when that all changes, I mean, hopefully we'll be back to normal sooner than later. Um, eh, but um, yeah, like it, it's 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 it would be it would be it would take the amount of time it would take to get over the bridge to do it regularly after work is is 
it's something that no one's been willing to do on a regular basis, put it that way. But we have had folks come over from Windsor um, to kick around. Mm. And that's kind of the stage we're at, you know, um, building up a list, getting people um, a, a, to kick around, show new players the basics of, um, you know, kicking, catching, um, you know, uh, and, and the basics of footy um, and, and seeing who, you know, ends up coming out on a regular basis. And Janet, um, like we were talking about earlier, um, who uh, runs the other Facebook page, she has the women's side, which is sort of has added men because she kind of started on the other side of town. I live north of Detroit in Gross Point, and she's over on the west side uh, of town uh, in Ferndale. But her original goal, like my original goal, my original goal, I wasn't really thinking about having women's um, – situation going on and she wasn't really thinking about men's but starting out you're just trying to get critical mass right um so i started going to hers and um she's had a couple of her folks come over and kick around with us uh, but we haven't gotten to the point where we've got a 30 to 40 committed folks where we'd be able to go and play the swans or anything like that we're we got a little bit of a ways to go um and it's tough because you know again um growing any sport that is not native to an area um the easiest and the fastest route to get things going is to have a small group that's highly committed that is able to travel right but it's also the fastest way to fall apart you know once some some if not all of those people move on so even just having these pages and growing the numbers of people who know what it is um is is something to to latch on to yeah bob just following on from what you mentioned there um has there been any interest from the australian community have you tried to involve the uh the club into the australian community there in michigan and and also you know any kind of partnership uh you know strategies with possibly the rugby club because i know detroit has quite a number of rugby clubs there <clears throat> There are a whole bunch of rugby clubs, and actually, um, the Gaelic football uh, club over in Canton had reached out about playing international rules, um, round ball, uh, rectangle field, um, and that was like I, I should probably reach back to them again because that was in sort of the beginning, two thousand seven ish or seventeen rather, um, if not eighteen, and we just like we didn't have the bodies yet, but. Um, that was something that we're looking at um, playing international rules game uh, with those guys. Um, and then the rugby folks, um, you know, I think back to the Australian community that's here, it, it's here, but it's very splintered. You know, it's engineers, just like everybody that end up working for Ford. Um, the, the one couple that uh, I had mentioned that we're really close with, um, they're the, the, the husband's a chemist and he was brought here by Pfizer and they were here Australia, and then before this, they were in Italy. Um, but they don't. They, there isn't really a, a common denominator. Um, you know, again, like in DC, where there's the embassy, or you know, there's not necessarily a place per se that brings that community together here, um, because there's nothing that really brings the city together. Period, <laughs> because it's so <laughs> spread out. Yeah, I can imagine, and. Um... Yeah, and that's kind of a recurring theme on Outside 50 uh, in terms of uh, the new club starting up. We talked to, uh, when, well, when Kraz and I uh, were still hosting together, uh, we talked to Mark Pierkowski in Memphis, and he mm -hmm. was in kind of a similar position, you know, kind of being almost a one-man band a little bit in terms of getting the club started, reaching out to Aussies, talking to Gaelic people, talking to rugby people, and uh, with varying degrees of success. And seems like you guys are in kind of a similar position um again with social media you guys can obviously reach out with like aussies in michigan or aussies in the midwest uh facebook groups but yeah you know there are definitely challenges in terms of uh you know getting a young base for a team in a city that doesn't necessarily always attract a lot of 20 and 30 somethings for work or for travel or things like that so it can definitely be challenging in terms of getting a core solid group that's committed and, you know, sort of moving forward from there. It is, but, we, but, you know, again, like one of the fun things that we've had the last two years is um, we found an establishment that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call the location unnamed that is uh, 
allowed us to watch the grand final in the middle of the night. And, um, it's, it's been fun because there, there, we've had some people who actually haven't, we, who haven't been out very much, um, or at, even at all who came out to, to watch the, the, the one we had a really good, uh, turnout was the one with Mason Cox, uh, the pies final, which was a barn burner. That was a great game. Um, we had a really good turnout. All these people came out for that game um, and, and watched. It was a lot of fun just hanging out. Um, and Ben's meeting. smiling because he's an Eagle supporter, and he's having very, very fond memories of that night. <laughs> it was great. It was a great, it was a great game, Bob. <laughs> no, one, of, one of the best games I've seen, and it happens when you're, when you're in the United States. They've made it to two grand finals while I've been here in the U.S. So That's there right. Go. Yeah, there you go. So you came to the right place. You might be a good watch on Ben. <laughs> Yeah. No, but good, good to hear, Bob. Like, that's a great way to get. I mean, we, we've heard that with uh, when we interviewed the team at Chicago, and um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of other cities have that success when they're holding a grand final watch party or an Australia Day party, or maybe even it could be an Anzac Day game or um, an IC, you know, the International Cup uh, watch party. Yeah. Those kind of things can really get the community around there. So those are those are great strategies. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Bob, uh, since we've been talking about recruitment and the struggles and stuff, why should people join Detroit? Like, what would make your team successful? What makes you want to keep playing for your team? What are some of the highlights versus all the downside that we've been talking about? What are some of the positive attributes of Detroit? Well, the downside is really the upside. I mean, because we're we're at the, the beginning point of it's more or less uh, an unstructured situation where we have our quote unquote kick arounds to come play. Like there's no pressure to, we're not, we're not suiting up in jumpers and heading on the bus to go play the Swans next week. So if you, if you're new to playing footy or want to try something new or meet new people, I mean, this is like the easiest way to do it. Um, and especially if you're new from town, I mean, that's me, um, you know, come on out. Yeah. And I think um, you're right, Bob. Absolutely. Like it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of positives to focus on and going off what, what Ben said in terms of recruitment. Yeah. I think it's kind of twofold. You know, you can have stuff like uh, an Anzac Day uh, occasion to get all the Aussies involved and connect with them. And then you can also have grand final parties for, you know, well, obviously for the Aussies, but for the Americans too, who might want to get involved and they're like, Oh, what's this? Like, you know, why, why not try that on my own, you know, here in the States? And, uh, yeah, I think it's good in terms of, like, uh, the plan that you all have in terms of just uh, getting the word out and getting people excited about it. Yeah. Are you guys uh, doing anything right now while we're in uh, quarantine life? Are you, are you trying to actively no. work within your club at all or any Zoom meetings or anything like that? Actually, lately I have not um, put anything up, but that's a great. Uh, last year, or year before, I put up a couple of beginner videos, and right now would be a good time actually for us to to do that. But um, no, right now, like in terms of actively, um, you know, recruiting or anything, now we're kind of on on hold. And uh, you know, again, the the biggest part of our our group is is um, you know getting together, um, and you know. Perhaps because it's where we started on our social media, that's where we need to end up right now, quite frankly. Um, and you know, keep pumping, uh, pumping clips of of you know footy action both here and in Australia, so that people can see you know, what it is and um, what it looks like. Absolutely. And um, kind of going back to what you said at the start of the podcast, you mentioned you had a you've lived in a bunch of different places, you know, kind of all up and down the Eastern seaboard, you know, you're from Connecticut, you were in New York, you were in Philly, you were in DC. Based on your experiences with like the um, Baltimore DC club or the former Baltimore DC club, I guess we should say, and, uh, and the pies in New York, what have been the biggest experiences that you've drawn from being with two historic established USAFL sides versus starting up a club on your own? What have been the biggest lessons that you've taken from being with the Pies or the Eagles? Uh, with the, I mean, what I was most impressed with was some of the guys that were playing with us with the Eagles. I mean, we're no spring chickens. Uh, there was a couple guys that were probably pushing 
50 who were pretty solid too. Um, and I was highly, I mean, you know, the usual suspects are no kids yet. I mean, they want to play at that level uh, and can make that kind of commitment to travel on the weekends and whatnot. I mean, once your own kids start playing sports, then you're trying to get a football in their hand. Um, but um, what I was impressed with, with, with the, the Eagles was that there were guys there that um, uh, were definitely older and, and staying in the mix. Um, some even like after their kids were a little bit older and were getting back into it, which was like really impressive um, because, you know, they, they're social, they want to get out, they want to play um, and, and how committed they were. Like the, the commitment level was very high uh, with the Eagles and I'm sure pretty much all the clubs are in, um, USAFL are pretty committed. I mean, the, the teams that are playing, the other teams are, are traveling quite a bit and, you know, they're putting money out of their own pockets and it's, and it's not even just, uh, you know, the, the money is the time too. Um, you know, if you're going up and down California or up and down the Eastern seaboard, um, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's a little tougher once you have kids playing and then, uh, then it's time to think about the next generation and teaching them how to play and os ball and all the rest. Yeah, it, it can be a grind. You know, I think I think it's very true whether it's uh, a young startup footy club here in the states or a, a historic local footy club in Perth or Melbourne or Adelaide. You know, being a footy administrator, being a club president, being a team captain, it's all a lot more demanding than it, you'd think it would be, and you know, it definitely takes a toll on a lot of aspects of your life and you've got to have a lot of I think mental toughness to be able to uh, stay the course and be disciplined in terms of helping that footy club grow organically no that's right yeah I mean I think that's one of the most like wonderful things about uh, our league is that we do have so many different types of players of all ages all backgrounds all skill levels I mean you wouldn't really see that a lot in like Australia at their high level of playing I mean you don't get that in the pros in Australia but here at our highest level you have such a wide breadth of people and new people coming in constantly so I think that's really cool that you were able to see that um, and then we also have the younger generation that are up and coming and you mentioned that you have kids are you teaching your children to play footy now so that they can continue the game they've had footballs in their hands yep um, and you know they just uh We've had actually a couple of little buddies with some play dates and down the field kicking around, um, as well as back in D.C. Um, I'm also involved in hockey, and I've used the game off ice um, as sort of an off ice training tool for motor skills, hand eye, foot eye. I mean, footy is great because, I mean, you have to have hand eye and foot eye, preferably both hands, both feet. I mean, you can't beat that. I mean, you know, yeah. it's not like baseball using one extremity and we're using four um and mm -hmm. hopefully all as well um so you know you can't beat it even if it's not your primary sport um so yeah we've got uh, we play i've been sharing it with the kids yes that's great oh yeah i reckon uh they must love telling their friends about it <laughs> but yeah um, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's um that's really great and uh yeah, you know, it's always good to inspire the next generation. And what I've always said, like, in terms of getting Americans involved is like, footies for everyone, age, race, gender, doesn't matter, doesn't matter how short you are, how tall you are, as long as you can bash a few blokes and kick a few goals, you're good to go. So, well, that's right. And I mean, like, one thing I like to point out, too, is that what's different about footy for especially for kids and, and like there's a lot of press right now even before like the COVID stuff about how intense youth sports have become in the U.S. and how it's become more of a professionalized uh, driven endeavor even at young ages whether it's soccer you know kids parents want them to play for Barcelona or little Jenny plays tennis and you know it's you know on to instruction because I'm going to play in Wimbledon or whatever footy because it's a domestic sport that's not native to here it's i guess i would call it a quote-unquote emerging sport if anything um non-native sport so the people that are getting involved aren't getting involved generally speaking well this may change because of you know people like mason cox but up until now 
people weren't getting involved in AFL football footy here in the U.S. because they thought their kids were going to go to Melbourne and play, right? They were doing it just because they wanted to do it. They saw it on TV. They thought it was cool. They thought it was fun. It was the same reason why kids were playing soccer in the U.S. 40 years ago. Their parents, or my parents, I'm dating myself, you know, weren't thinking, oh, man, my kid is going to play in MLS or was going to play uh, soccer abroad. That, that didn't exist. And, and for the better, quite frankly, um, because you played because you liked it. Um, and the kids owned it. And that's something that footy has going for it, that the fact that it's not structured yet, um, you know, it's like the Chinese proverb, um, is that's, that's what's so good about it right now. Yeah, and in terms of the spread of the game internationally, it's it's an uphill struggle, you know. Uh, it was pretty well documented that uh, when round one was played a few months back and all the American sports were canceled, but the AFL was still on just for a week. And, you know, you were like, oh, my God, this is it. Like, we're going right, to yeah. finally break through to the American audiences. I mean, you're not the first person, Bob, who said, like, oh, I first discovered footy when I, it was on ESPN in the 80s. So, yeah, That's right. it's... Yeah, there's definitely um, you know, just a lack of trans-Pacific publicity, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I think you're right about um, in terms of getting kids and families involved in terms of just getting the word out about footy. And once the club starts officially, you guys can definitely have family events, have Oz Kick events, get the, get the community involved because that's what really helps the club culture take root. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a fantastic sport and it, there's no reason why if you if you can get a footy in your hands, I mean, you can play. I mean, it's it's a it's a low barrier of entry um which is is key. Um so, you know, anyone adult or kid, I mean, doesn't need to have a lot to get going. You just need to have the ability to get your friends on the pitch with you to to go. <laughs> yeah. That's right, Bob. I mean, you'd be amazed how many times just even going into a going into a gym and just having whether it be my crow shirt on or having a footy in my hand and I'm doing some work there, how that attracts, you know, a whole new potential market, especially in an in environment like a like a gym, which, you know, in I mean Detroit I know has a quite a large CrossFit community there. Um yeah. you know, so you know, when you've got athletes like that that have just that natural competitive streak. And I mean, that's at, a, that's at a whole new level and you show them a game that they can put that energy into. I mean, that opens up some amazing opportunities. So yeah, I think, you know, like you said, the, the youth aspect, and we've spoken about it a number of times, I think is a key. Um, so it sounds like you're, you know, you're setting a really good foundation there for, um, you know, for long-term growth of the game there in Michigan. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to ask, what do you think uh, it would be the number one thing that you would recommend the U.S. doing to um, help change or what would you think we should change about footy in the United States to get it more of a popular sport here? Well, I think that the TV thing made a big difference. Like when when it was on ESPN, if, if, if this stuff is on television during the day, it makes a big difference because even if it's not yet matured and organized the the idea is planted and the kids that are going to end up playing it see it and then they want to replicate it and then they do it and then they own it and then it carries on i mean rugby is a good example i mean um you know rugby at this point um has been around actually in the u.s for a long time on college campuses and this is maybe another conversation for another day about footy and college in college settings but um you know Rugby has been in, in colleges in the U.S. for a long time, but it's been more of a social endeavor. And clearly the U.S. Is, has not been a international power of any sort, but it certainly has brought many generally men, now women, together uh, for, for a long time. But in the last 10 years, that started, the Rugby Seven started to be um, put on uh, NBCSN, the finals uh, in Philadelphia, um, and then, of course, it was added to the Olympics. And once you have primetime, daytime television where people can see um, even better American kids playing rugby, it, all of a sudden, like that just ratchets up um, the growth. Um, you know, it was already growing 
by for a long time, but not on like a serious uh, uh, pace uh, versus now, you know, again, it's the Chinese paradigm. I mean, like what, what you gain needs to be uh, looked at in, in terms of what you lose as well. I mean, it gets more serious, which is great for seeing the, the quality program on TV, but at the same time, you don't want to lose your grassroots programs for the people who are getting into it as well. Um, mm -hmm. So if we could see footy on TV, like a grand final, and, you know, again, we have the, ch the time challenge, um, or if the AFL's, uh, you know, prime time uh, big events were on an outlet, um, I think that would definitely spark, uh, spark some things. Yeah, you, the growth of rugby internationally, that's a very good comparison. Um, and yeah, that, that definitely plays a big role in getting the publicity um, or making it more available or more obvious for American viewers. But um, yeah, there is that disconnect and it applies in both countries. Like so many people in Australia don't know that the International Cup is a thing. I lived in Melbourne. No, basically, no one knew what it was. And I've talked right. about this with my, uh, with my friend Troy Thompson over at World Footy News. Uh, he, there's like, and he's like, yeah, mate, you know, every three years you might get a small paragraph about it in the Herald Sun and that's about it. And similarly over on our side of the Pacific, you know, the time difference is huge. Not right. many people, regardless of age, are going to be watching sports at three or four in the morning. And also I think, um, you know, how many people in America know who Mason Cox is, you know, right. like how many people know that this sport is something that could be a huge thing. And I, there have also been people who, um, you know, maybe Aussies who played basketball here in uni um, and decided to go back and, and give it a go in the AFL, Hugh Greenwood. Um, it's kind of funny. I actually have a ironic personal connection to Hugh. Um, for those who don't know, he's a on baller for the Gold Coast Suns, formerly of Adelaide. And um, he played college basketball here in the States. And uh -huh. he, happened, he happened to play for my rival school, the University of New Mexico. And I went, uh -huh. to, New Mexico, I went to New Mexico State. And uh, he would always destroy us on the basketball court. And I'm like, this kid is something special. And he always played with a real physical streak. I only knew, or I only found out after the fact that he was an Aussie. And then he made headlines when he decides to give up a potential NBA career and go back to Oz. He's from Tassie originally. And mm -hmm. apparently... No joke. Some one of the recruiters for Adelaide had followed him for like a decade, from when he was playing under 15s footy to when he went to the U.S. to play basketball. And he would still be like, "Oh, hey, you know, if you ever want to come back and uh, <laughs> if you ever want to come back and uh, try the AFL out, you know, give us a ring." <laughs> and uh, yeah, so crossover athletes like that can yep, definitely yep. Help bridge the gap. And obviously, Mason Cox was an example of that as well. He was a basketball guy who was just a walk on, but he just happened to be enormous. So he got some attention. And then when he <laughs> graduated, he got a call from the AFL and he ha already had a job lined up after graduation. And then he's just like, Oh no, I'm going to move halfway around the world to play a sport. I've barely heard of. Why not? <laughs> That's right. So yeah, it's crazy to think about, but yeah, there's not really enough. Um, You know, there isn't really you, anything specific that can really bridge the gap. I do think a key is like the potential AFL game in California, which might Well, yeah, and that's that was on the tip of my tongue. I mean, mm. the only thing the only thing that could outdo a primetime televised game US time would be bringing the bringing the thing here, uh, the show mm. on the road, barnstorming. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah. barnstorming, you know, NFL does it, right? I mean, uh basketball does it, NBA does it, hockey does it. Uh, baseball does it um, you know uh, I think that would be a big big deal if there were you know half a dozen games in the U.S. I don't know where you put it um, but uh, yeah that would be a huge huge thing yeah we talked about that a bit um, or Kraz and I did a while ago in terms of like you know the speculation of oh what would that look like what stadium would they use like Obviously, uh, we owe Kevin Sheedy a great debt, I reckon, because he's been the one who's constantly pushing the idea of bringing footy overseas. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully with the two teams that he coached, obviously uh, Essendon and GWS as well. So, uh, you know, hopefully like maybe 2022, 2023, but it really is exciting to think about. And that could really be a game changer. You know, obviously the tendency is to be 
maybe a bit pessimistic because, you know, uh, it's hard. It's just hard, you know, pushing against that expectation or, you know, being an underground sport in a country that doesn't know what it is. So, yeah, but I think there's a lot of potential. Yeah, the tackling alone without pads, I think, will entice people. People love the the competitiveness of the sport, the aggression of the sport, and the fact that we play without pads, which is the best part. And we get limited concussions and really injuries, which is always impresses people as well, because the NFL always has so many injuries. And I tell people when they try to play our sport, they always are worried about, you know, tackling and stuff. And they're always concerned about getting hurt. And I'm like, guys, the chances of you getting hurt outside of me, because I always get injured, the chances <laughs> of you getting hurt are very small, actually. The way we tackle is totally different. And, um, you know, we actually have Australians that come over and even teach NFL players how to properly tackle to reduce concussions. So I think the United States would love the opportunity to watch such a fast paced game and an aggressive game here. I think that'd be amazing to see. Hopefully that comes to fruition soon. Yep. Yeah, if you can dream it, it can happen. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, it's just, you know, having people with the vision and also the connections with the resources to, to make that occur. I mean, um, you know, no one would have foreseen soccer becoming what it was, you know, before 1990 about, um, you know, I mean, two years ago, uh, Ireland was playing the all blacks and rugby in Chicago to a full stadium. Uh, packed house i mean most of these people know that their last name starts with an o or whatever and they're there um and you know if you had uh yeah a game and, and could find a ground a uh, proper place to put a field um to have an afl game i mean uh, i'm sure the same would happen uh here yeah that's a great point, Bob. I mean, you know, you look at other sports, you know, you look, look at Japan in rugby. You'd have said in, you'd have said in the 90s that Japan, you know, we're going to beat, beat the Springboks, you know, also knock off Ireland in a World Cup. People probably would have been mm. questioning your, your, right. your sanity there. You know, look at Australia with its soccer development. It's exactly what you said. I mean, yep. you know, they'd pretty much given up on on making a World Cup, let alone even you know, trying to qualify. It just was a, it was a pipe dream. So you look at all of that and then you look at as well, um, you know, exciting times for Michigan. You've got a, you've got a Saints player now as your, uh, as a the Lions. That's right. Yep. That's yeah, right. Aaron Cyclops yeah. there's uh, signed up and we've seen how that benefits as well from having players like Ben Simmons in the NBA in, in Philadelphia yep. from having, you know, you've got obviously, you know, Michael Dixon at, um, you know, Seattle there. So there is that, that benefit of having an, an ambassador, if you like, who can really help grow the the, the uh, exposure of the game in, more, in more detail. Yeah, mm. yeah. I, I've said um, privately to various uh, USAFL people that like, how good would it be if Mason Cox, once he retires, comes back to the states and you know opens up a camp or an academy to help teach American kids how to play Aussie rules? If you're if you're listening to this, Coxie, uh, it's a suggestion. <laughs> I think he's con- I think he's contracted yeah. to the Crows, right? So. Oh come on! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Bob, how can we best support Detroit um, in helping you guys grow? What would be the one thing you want to give a shout out for your team, or how can we best support you or others support you? um drive people to our facebook page um and tell people that living in detroit is not what you see and michigan's a fine place it's a fine peninsula if you look around you um so come to michigan come to detroit play footy um you'll meet a lot of people and uh there's a lot of good beer in the state too so (laughs) you got that going gotta love the beer (laughs) yes exactly yeah, well, thanks so much for stopping by, Bob. You know, it means a lot that you're willing to share a little bit of your story with us and uh, help us um, get more exposure for Detroit. And uh, we're really excited to see what the future holds for you. You know, um, you're, a, you're a positive guy, and I think there's going to be a lot of good things happening on the horizon uh, once, once the season starts. Yeah, thanks to all of you. Good chat.
Yeah, thank you again. And you guys, uh, make sure you check out Outside 50 Podcasts and U.S. Footy News. All of our podcasts are on there. So head on over, ask your friends to join, and have a listen. Cheers, Bob. Have a good one. Thanks, all. Thanks, Bob. Outside 50 is brought to you with the help of Play Aussie USA. Play Aussie is the only place in the USA you can buy the famous Sharon football, a proud sponsor of the USAFL. Visit them at playaussie.com.